Alleluia, Christ is risen. The phrase, a little while, occurs seven times in the gospel reading this morning. A little while is a messianic term. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea all use it to convey the coming of the Messiah. The the exact time is unknown, but it's imminent. The Lord is coming soon, so they should be ready. And Jesus appropriates this language, and he applies it to himself, to his death and resurrection a little while. He'll be removed from the disciples' sight and then appear to them again. And they understand the nuance. They know it's a messianic term, and it means the messianic age has come upon them, and then also the day of judgment. But they don't want it in a little while. They want it now. Lust for easy gain is a human universal. It's common to all of fallen humanity. In this broken and dying world, there is no real victory, not total victory, over greed. The best we can do is suppress it. Struggling economies and questionable wars sit upon complicated histories, and they're driven by sinful motives and past crimes that aren't easily undone, even when they're recognized. And even when we crawl out of such crises, at some time, in the not-too-distant future, barring our Lord's return, there will be another crisis. There will be another recession. There will be another murderous tyrant, another questionable war, and there will be more victims caught in impossible situations created by greed, lust, power, and lies. As long as our Lord delays his return, children will starve, the weak will be oppressed, men will lie and kill. Now, we're not all equally guilty of everything, but we are all guilty. The evil banker and the corrupt government official are easy targets, but they couldn't have done these things without us. Con men always prey upon our desire for easy gain. The Levitical law saw and understood current and future messes as the constant reality of humanity after the fall. The main purpose of the law was to provide a means whereby people could be cleansed from their sin and they could come safely before God to receive his grace and blessings. But the burden of the law, which in some places seems arbitrary and other places seems, well, cruel or bigoted, is simply impossible to keep. No one remains clean under the law. The people and the priests were in constant need of cleansing. That was the whole point of it. Not even our Lord Jesus Christ remained clean under the law. That's not to say that he sinned. To be sure, he did not sin. He didn't fail to keep God's commandments or his moral law. He loved God perfectly, and he loved his neighbor as himself perfectly. But he was rendered unclean by the Levitical law. Now, the Levitical law doesn't damn unless it's ignored or rejected. It simply exposes how sick and how unclean we are. And then, blessedly, it provides the means of blood. In first the tabernacle and then the temple, whereby God's people could be cleansed and their fellowship with the Father restored. Our messy lives, complicated lives, both personally and nationally in our culture, are like unto that which the Levitical law exposes. We are unclean. And we are helpless if left on our own. The law serves the gospel unless it's ignored or rejected, and only then does it condemn. But if the holy law is recognized as having its source in the perfect will of God, if it's submitted to, which is to say, if we repent, then the law leads us to the gospel. 
your heavenly Father and the holy angels don't mourn because you feel your sins or that you're frustrated or ashamed or that you're sad over them and want to be free of them. All of heaven rejoices over repentance and faith. Your sorrow over sin isn't an evil thing, even though the sin that causes it is evil. It's good to repent. It's good to be sorry for your sins. It's good to want to do better, and it's good to confess that God is good and that you aren't, that you've sinned when you need mercy. And it's infinitely good and blessed if that drives you to the Messiah whose blood covers your sin and restores fellowship to the Heavenly Father. And not in some metaphoric way, not in some symbolic way, but if it drives you to the actual blood that the Messiah shed for you, which he gives you to drink, that you might be cleansed and have fellowship with the Father. The saints of old, Abraham, Moses, David, all of them, waited for the little while of the Messiah's coming to redeem Israel. Their entire time of waiting was infected with uncleanness and a need for God's gifts in the temple to keep them safely in his grace. We wait in our own little while for the Messiah's coming on the last day. God keeps us in himself by his word and his bodily presence in the Holy Communion. But on both sides of the incarnation, for those saints who looked forward to the coming of Jesus, and for those of us who look back on his coming, we rejoice that the Messiah has come for us. But on either side, both people, both groups of people live constantly in Holy Saturday. The Lord has finished the law. He has finished death. He has finished sins. He has finished the devil. He has finished hell for us. And yet, we can't see him with our own eyes. He has taken away our guilt. He has declared us righteous, holy, and innocent in his blood. And yet, on Holy Saturday, while we wait for the final Easter, we still have our sins with us. We all still have memories of our sins. And those don't go away just because we've been declared righteous. There's a civil war being waged in each of us between the old man and the new creation in Christ. Our old Adam remembers sin and he delights in it. Even as the new man in Christ fears loves and trusts in God above all things and is ashamed of his sin. We are all of two minds conflicted by a desire for God to be obedient to his law and a desire for the flesh. And the Lord God in his mercy holds us as innocent We don't answer him for our sins. But at the same time, there are earthly consequences. We do have to make recompense. We must bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We have to promise and make it up to the people we've wronged. We even have to suffer temporal punishments for our sins at times. Consider the thief on the cross. He believed in Jesus even confessed him as Lord, and yet he still had to be executed for his crime. More than that, we have to take on disciplines to stop ourselves from acting out sins in physical, earthly ways. We might not overcome them on this side of glory, but by God's grace, we might suppress them. We are declared righteous in Christ even now but we're also still in the little while. And we're waiting to see God face to face with our own eyes. And while we wait for that final Easter, for the last day, for the resurrection of the dead, our sins hurt ourselves. And they hurt the people we love. They hurt our society and our country. They even hurt this creation. 
And we suffer from them and we suffer from the sins of others because we are all a people of unclean lips and unclean hands. Now, it would be obviously better if there were no little while at all. If we could just be whisked away at the moment of our baptism, or just as the blood of Christ was poured into us, or as we were singing, Christ the Lord is risen today, and our hearts were soaring with the joy of the resurrection, then we'd be fine. If there were no delay, no wait, no Holy Saturday, if we could believe in Jesus and then be taken immediately to heaven, then we could truly be a holy and righteous people. The disciples thought the same thing. It would have been easier for them as well if there had been no Holy Saturday at all. If the Lord would have finished his work on the sixth day, restoring creation on Good Friday, and then immediately risen from the dead. But to speculate into such questions as why God redeemed us this way and not another, why he insists on taking such pains and making us suffer, those questions may not always lead to heresy or blasphemy, but they certainly open the door. And they often end up with us putting the ways and thoughts of God into submission to our own ways and thoughts. Now, we can certainly see that our Lord's rest on that final Sabbath fulfills the law. He rests in the tomb, fulfilling the Sabbath. We can also see in St. John's Revelation that our Lord delays his return for the sake of the elect who haven't yet been baptized. And yet, why it's this way and not some other, we don't know. What we do know is that God has revealed himself in the Holy Scriptures as the God who forgives sins through the death and resurrection of the Messiah. He loves us. He's merciful to us. He isn't angry with us. His wrath has been appeased on our behalf. And it's been revealed that we are safe when the angel of death passes over because we are marked with the blood of the Lamb. God has revealed himself to us there as the champion who has defeated death because he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we know that he's good, that he's constant in his mercy, and that he promises to work all things together for good. And yet... His ways aren't our ways, but his ways are best, even when we experience them now as pain, sorrow, frustration, guilt, and shame, even when we must wait a little while and we don't want to. There's one final thing to notice in this gospel reading this morning. The Lord changes the person who does the seeing at the end of the account. At first he tells them in a little while they will see him again. But it's not their seeing that will ultimately give them joy, but it's his seeing. He says at the end of his speech, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Even on Holy Saturday, even when his body was resting in the tomb, awaiting reunion with his soul and the resurrection on Easter, when the disciples couldn't see him, he saw them. And their joy comes because the Lord is merciful and he's watching over them. They were attacked, they were sorrowful. But they were never in any real danger, and nor was their sorrow enduring or as great as the joy that was to come, which they have now in full. The Lord Christ kept watch over them, and he didn't fail. He didn't fall asleep. And so also does he see you. Even though now he's ascended to his Father's right hand, And you see his risen body only by faith in the Holy Communion. You confess 
against your eyes what God's Word has said and what He gives you there. He and the holy angels are constantly before the Father, constantly rejoicing in your faith and your good works, watching you, watching over you. And in Christ, you are righteous. And the Son of God himself, the second person of the Holy Trinity, is your own advocate in the counsel of the Godhead, ever pointing to his hands and his feet and his side. The marks of your ransom, the payment, by his stripes you are healed, and the promise that God himself has made for you. The sufferings of this present time aren't worthy of comparison to the glory that is to be revealed. God is good, and his mercy endures forever. He remembers his promises, and your sorrow will turn to joy. Even though this world is frustrating and painful, and even though your sins are consistent and terrible, the Lord God is even more consistent, and he is more constant in his mercy. He sees you now, and he will see you to the end. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. In Jesus' name.